Uh, well, thank you for that nice introduction. This is uh, a great conference for me to be a part of. I'm usually presenting at science conferences with totally reductionist people who um, aren't as warm and inviting as everyone is here, so this is a real pleasure. Um, back in 2005, I was working in a neuroscience lab looking at the impact of certain interventions like MDMA on the, the brain health of rats. And I was presenting some of my research at the Society for Neuroscience meetings, so one of these conferences that I frequent. This is uh, tens of thousands of neuroscientists, of brain scientists, packed into a room. And that year, I was really excited to see the keynote speaker to this conference. Now, it was relatively controversial to have this man give the keynote to a bunch of reductionist brain scientists that year. People actually protested. Some people didn't go. Some people actually didn't go to the conference because he was there. Um, but I was excited because I had just started a mindfulness and meditation practice myself. And I was seeing some of the transformative effects in my own life that you can get from applying these practices. And so the Dalai Lama gave a beautiful speech about the ethics in science and the need for a secular ethics for people who are developing these core, powerful technologies like brain science. But at the very end, he went off script. And he said something that day that changed the whole course of my life, and especially the course of my research life. He looked out in the audience after giving this beautiful speech, and he said, all the brain scientists in this room, if any of you can create an intervention, maybe a brain surgery or some type of chemical intervention, that would allow me, the Dalai Lama, to get the benefits of meditating without having to meditate for two hours a day, he would be the first to sign up. <laughs> right. So that was not the response in that room. The response in that room was complete quiet. There was like at least five to 10,000 people. I'm not quite sure, sure how many people were in that room, but it was quiet because many of those people were actually doing things to the brain, like putting electrodes in them to control behavior. And some of us knew that although we can't do what the Dalai Lama was talking about now, maybe that's a far off sci-fi possibility in the future. And so this question, can technology and science dramatically accelerate the benefits of mindfulness, was sort of unconsciously rolling around in the back of my head all throughout my scientific training. Now, between 2005 and 2015, there was a, a new science called the contemplative science, which is a relatively controversial science within the neurosciences. But it was looking at the impact of mindfulness and meditation and things like yoga on the brain on well-being and behavior. And by 2015, there was enough evidence to publish in one of the prestigious journals. This isn't mine, this is another lab. But looking at the effects of mindfulness acutely and over time on brain function. So we don't know a lot about what's going on with mindfulness in the brain so far, but we know enough to have these fuzzy little cartoon pictures, at least, about what brain areas are targeted and specifically how the network dynamics are changing over time as the practices are applied. But what was really important from this literature is it's not just the state changes that are incurred from mindfulness practice. It's actually the trait level changes that occur over time by cultivating mindfulness skills. And so I'm reading this literature all throughout my graduate school training, and I'm also involved in very powerful neuromodulatory technologies uh, in the operating room. So this one's called deep brain stimulation. It's basically a surgical implantation of electrodes down into the brain to treat certain neurological diseases like Parkinson's as well as psychiatric diseases like depression. So this is kind of what it looks like in the operating room. Um, I'm actually in the operating room during the surgeries. I'm recording EEG or electrical activity from the brain as this is occurring. Um, here, what you're seeing is actually a person's head. It's kind of hard to make out. That's a human person there with a hole in their head. Uh, and the robot is actually guiding an electrode down into the subthalamic nucleus of the basal ganglia. So this is to treat Parkinson's disease. So I saw several of these throughout my graduate training. And for Parkinson's disease, at least, every single patient's lives were transformed. I mean, it was almost like watching a miracle. Sometimes I cried the first time, actually, but I didn't show anybody. Um, but some of the nurses would cry in the first time that they would see this because you could see that this was giving a person some functionality back to their life and giving them some sort of meaningful control over their motor system throughout the end of their life. 
And so, as I'm watching these surgeries, that little thing that the Dalai Lama said was in the back of my head. What if there was a surgery, he said, that would give him the benefits of mindfulness without actually having to meditate? And so I thought about calling up the Dalai Lama, asking him to come to the operating room and do this. I think he would actually do that, but for political reasons, you know, the people around him probably wouldn't let him. But, you know, even if this was possible, which I'm not going to tell you this is possible today, this is not what we're doing, this isn't the type of technology that we're going after because we want something that will scale. We want to be able to reduce suffering on a massive scale and have a technology that's cheap enough to take it out of the lab and out of the well-to-do communities and into communities that really need it. And so with that, I started looking for other technologies that were a safe way to modulate the brain, but that would give us the specificity of deep brain stimulation. Now, these technologies are called transcranial brain stimulation. Usually, you would use small currents that are safe to use in the brain, or uh, strong magnets that it can actually cause electric currents. And the idea is that you're, you're just slightly changing brain functionality or plasticity for a desired goal, so treatment of depression, for example. The problem here is that you can't get very deep in the brain, and the contemplative neurosciences that is emerging is sort of suggesting that we need to go deeper than the, the sort of surface of the cortex. So I started investigating a technology that you might not think would be able to stimulate the brain. It's actually focused ultrasound. So you can focus an ultrasound beam, you can get the mechanical energy through the skull, and that mechanical energy can actually act on the neurons to change neural activity. Now, if you do it with low-intensity ultrasound, it's safe. It doesn't do any long-term damage, but it gives you the ability to modulate with focal specificity. Um, so here, you're looking sort of top-down into the brain. This is a human skull, and the focused ultrasound beam has been focused into the skull. So you can see how specific it can be, at least in theory at this point. What's really neat is that you can focus it to almost any target. So here they're actually targeting the thalamus, which is one of the deepest structures to get to in the brain. And a recent lab at UCLA uh, was targeting the thalamus with focus ultrasound and woke a patient up from a coma. It was a traumatic brain injury patient. It's one case, uh, so it needs to be replicated, but it at least demonstrates how powerful this technology could be. Now, my background's in visual neuroscience, so here's a case where they're actually focusing the ultrasound into the visual system. This is in the MRI, so you can do this concurrently with a uh, functional MRI. And basically the idea is if you can perturb the visual system, if you can cause it to fire, you could actually cause a little visual hallucination that's temporary for the subjects. So these people are in an MRI, the focused ultrasound is hitting their visual system, and as you can see, the bold activation, so the blood activation, um, the, the sort of signal of the MRI actually expressed and 70% of the patients actually had a little visual phosphine, which is a little visual hallucination that was temporary. So that demonstrates how powerful and how specific this technology could be. So in graduate school, I started wondering um, about that question that the Dalai Lama implanted into my brain so long ago. Can we focus ultrasound into the parts of the brain that are involved in meditation, in learning how to meditate or in being in a mindful state and induce the state or help the person learn to meditate. So here we started targeting the anterior cingulate cortex, which is a part of the brain that's essentially involved in bringing your attention back. Your attention goes away, you have to bring it back over and over, that's the practice. So with this, we actually just brought subjects into the lab. We didn't give them any mindfulness training. We just sat them down and, and basically zapped their anterior cingulate. And as you can see here, the ones who got fussed, focused ultrasound, increased on a scale of mindfulness. Uh, this is a non-attachment scale that's been validated. Relative to placebo, there was no effect. They actually went down a little bit, which makes sense. So we had a little bit of evidence here that just targeting areas that we know are involved in mindfulness and attention, we could put someone in something like a mindful state. But the question was not whether we could just put someone in a, a small mindfulness state, but whether we could dramatically and vastly accelerate mindfulness practice. That's what the Dalai Lama was talking about. And so, uh, not being a mindfulness expert myself, I didn't really know where to take this next. Uh, enter the next person in my life who completely changed everything. This is Shenzhen Young. Uh, he is a mindfulness expert, a uh, mindfulness teacher, who is really a scholar of both Eastern and Western religions, as well as science. And he's collaborated with many scientists in the contemplative sciences looking at the effects of mindfulness on the brain. 
And he's written a great book that's looking at the intersection between contemplative practice, the sort of Eastern wisdom traditions, and Western science, the sort of rational traditions. And interestingly enough, in the back of this book, Shenzhen wrote, um, what if there was a way to use some type of technology to techno-boost into enlightenment, as he said it. So I'm using the E word here, which would be evil to use at a neuroscience conference. Um, and he actually said, out of all the interventions that he had thought about or tried, he thought focused ultrasound would be the one. Um, now Shenzhen's not a scientist, his background is, uh, is not as a trained scientist, but he reads a lot of scientific literature and he had sort of been following what was going on. And so I teamed up with Shenzhen and we started talking about what would this really look like? What would a mindfulness boosted paradigm, a techno boosted paradigm of mindfulness really look like? How could we do that safely? How could we make sure that we're putting people in a dimension of trait level change that's a good thing for that person and not something that's uh, causing them to dysregulate their sleep or lose some other type of cognitive functioning? So we talked about it and talked about it. Shenzhen can talk for hours and hours and hours if you've ever met him. Uh, he has a beautiful mind. Um, and then we came up with a paradigm to test this as a pilot case. So in the lab, you typically want to operationalize what you're studying, sort of carefully define it so you can test it objectively. That's been a big problem in the contemplative neurosciences. How do you define mindfulness? This is a very simple definition that doesn't do it any justice. But I've started adopting the way that Shenzhen actually defines it in his unified mindfulness practice, which is essentially the acquisition of certain attention skills that when working in unison, combine to give you what we can call mindful awareness. So equanimity is basically having a sort of balanced mind. So when sensations, thoughts, and feelings arise, you let them rise and you let them pass without getting attached to them and without resisting or pushing against them. That's probably the most crucial feature. Sensory clarity is being able to track what's going on in the sensory domain moment by moment, cycle by cycle. That's a really easy thing for a vision scientist to operationalize and study. Concentration power, also easy to operationalize. It's focusing on what you're trying to focus on. So if you're trying to focus on me instead of the buzzing magical box in your pocket, um, your concentration power is giving you that ability to stay here and ignore what's going on. And the idea, the claim, at least in the contemplative practices, is that by having mindfulness, mindful awareness, and bringing it into everyday life, by having these skills and applying them effortfully, you actually lead in the long term to these trait level changes. Increases in curiosity, for example, decreases in neuro neuroticism, decreases in ruminative thinking. The sort of traits that some of us have built in through our genetics, through just an unlucky lottery, can be changed over time by applying these practices. So Shenzhen and I came up with this kind of uh, far out idea, as Mikey was talking about, about trying to modulate deep brain structures to help people zoom into mindful awareness and to, to acquire these mindfulness skills quicker. There's a lot of different brain targets, and if you can actually specifically modulate them, you should lead to different effects, different psychological and neurological outcomes. Now, one of our favorite targets is the default mode network, which many of you have probably heard about by now. This is basically what happens when you put a person in an MRI and you don't give them anything to do. It was discovered essentially by accident. And it's called the default mode because it's the default mode that a person goes in when they're not actively engaged in a task. Now, some people claim that this is the neural substrate of the self. As Raoul Kahn said yesterday, I don't think we can go that far. Um, basically, we know that it has something to do with self-expression, self-referential thinking, egoic consciousness, whatever you want to call it. And we know that from several lines of evidence. Um, for example, in depression, the more rumination that you have, the more sort of recursive negative thinking, the more default mode activity you'll see. And actually, nicely, as a narrative, the more mindfulness experience you have, the opposite pattern that you see in the default mode. So blue means less activation relative to controls. And the less activation is in people who have a lot of mindfulness experience. Now, for this conference, uh, actually, the psychedelic brain or the brain on psychedelics looks something like the one there on the left or on your right. Uh, you see deactivation because something about the essential self-narrative system is being sort of taken down, down-regulated for a bit of time. So Shinzen and I uh, started talking about these different targets that were emerging in the literature 
and trying to figure out what a first experiment would look like. How could we do this on people in a safe way? What if we zoom people too quickly into these mindfulness states and they don't have any experience with this? Wouldn't that be a bad thing? And so we decided to start with very advanced meditators, people who have a lot of experience cultivating mental skills, mental practices, and sort of altered states, if you want to talk about them like that. And the person I knew uh, that was the closest to me with that experience was actually Shenzhen. Um, so he very happily signed up to be the first subject as a pilot experiment. What we have to do, as you can see on the screen, we have to load his brain into a computer and use a process called neuronavigation. So we find the target, we tell the computer, this is the little tiny target that we want in the brain, and then it uses a set of cameras and reflectors to tell us exactly where to place the transducer, the ultrasound transducer, to focus that beam down into the brain. So Shenzhen went through a two-week protocol with this. He was getting ultrasound every third day. The ultrasound is being delivered in very small bursts over an hour. It's very low intensity. Of course, you can't feel it because it's ultrasound. And he gets about 60 of these pulses over an hour. He's meditating the whole time while this is going on. And the first reports, um, to our surprise actually, was that Shenzhen started claiming he was sinking deeply into equanimity. So that sort of mental balance state. That's obviously a very familiar state for Shenzhen. He's been meditating for 50 years. But we sort of retooled the system, waited a couple months um, to make sure he was okay, and then did the experiment again. The next time he went through a three-week protocol and he started saying things in the lab like, this is the most significant intervention I've ever experienced. Which was like, whoa, really? I mean, you've been meditating for 50 years, isn't that the most significant one? But he said that basically he started gaining insights much like he was gaining from meditation over the long periods. So now this is Shenzhen, he's a very special case. Uh, this was, I was placeboing every once in a while, but mostly I was unblinded to that. So these are two very biased people who really want this to work. And uh, we couldn't make too much of that. I really shouldn't be speaking too much about it without replicating it, right? So we took five advanced meditation practitioners and we ran them through a four-day protocol. Uh, same sort of intervention. They're getting um, the pulses while they're meditating over an hour. And the majority of them said, yep, it's zooming me right into equanimity. It feels like that one hour of meditation is like being on a retreat where I've totally uh, you know, unplugged from the world and I'm focusing on mindfulness for 14 hours a day. These are Zen meditators. So many of them were very surprised, actually. A couple of them were super skeptical about this. They were making claims like, mindfulness works. Why do we need to add some kind of technology on top of it? Um, and I think we might have converted a few of them. So with that, we decided, okay, now we need to do this properly. We need to put this in the lab. We need to have proper double-blinded controls. And we need to do this in people who aren't biased by being sort of a part of the contemplative path already. And so we started what we're calling the SEMA Lab at the University of Arizona in collaboration with the Center for Consciousness Studies. SEMA stands for sonication, so that's, what it, that, that's the term you use when you're putting ultrasound energy into the brain. You're sonicating the brain or you're sonicating the body. Um, enhanced mindful awareness. Sonication enhanced mindful awareness. So adding sonication to the mindfulness paradigm. And the claim here is not that we're going to replace mindfulness and people are just gonna come get a zap and they're done. Um, that would be great, but I'm not sure if that's possible given the way the brain works. The claim is actually that by sonicating specific parts of the brain, we can uh, accelerate the acquisition of these attentional skills. And over time, people will learn them, integrate them quicker into their lives, and then get mindful awareness out into the world where it's gonna change their lives. Um, the protocol that we're designing is pretty standard for a mindfulness experiment. It's a two-month protocol. Uh, we start out with a conceptual framework, so a, a bit of priming of the subject, which is a good thing in this case, because we want to tell them, uh, first we want to learn you know, what they want to get out of a protocol like this. Also, we want to tell them how this is going to influence their lives and should impact their sort of base level of well-being and happiness. Um, then we give them focus techniques, so different mindfulness practices over a several week period. So this is prior to the intervention, they're just learning mindfulness, they're coming into the lab. And then on top of that, we add sonication sessions if they're ready. 
So this is the next two weeks. They're getting this every other day. And they're coming into the lab and performing these focus techniques while they're getting the ultrasound. Now, importantly, we have personal support available for them throughout this whole thing and the, two, and, and the month after that where they're going to continue to do this practice. Then again, up to six months after that, they have personal mindfulness coaches who are really trained to deal with uh, what can come up during mindfulness training. Mindfulness isn't all good. I mean, if there's some trauma in the system, something can come up, and that needs to be integrated as the person sort of changes their traits over time. And so now we're talking about accelerating that path, and we need to have the support so people can integrate. The first couple of studies actually are going to be going towards clinical applications. So uh, we're teaming up with several labs. Um, some of, of those are here at Stanford um, and around the Bay Area. And in Tucson, we're actually going after chronic pain and addiction first. The idea is to bring people in who have uh, addiction in the pain clinic and the addiction clinic, run them through the two-month SIMA protocol, and give them some relatively immediate relief of whatever the clinical problem is that's causing suffering, that acute suffering. But the hypothesis, the claim, is that by giving them these attentional skills, those skills can then be applied to their everyday life. So they'll start seeing that those same things that they were using to reduce, say, the addiction cycle can also be applied to interacting with their spouse or hanging out with their kids or dealing with some type of emotional issue that may come up. And so really, broadly, what we're expecting is that these mindfulness skills and the acquisition of these skills should increase base levels of well-being and happiness broadly and deeply defined. Now, of course, as a scientist, I want to operationalize that too. And working with Shenzhen, he, he, I, I think I almost can say literally can operationalize everything. Um, I'm sure there's something he can't. But he's actually operationalized happiness as this really beautiful table. It's called the, happiness, it's called the periodic table of happiness elements, much like the periodic table of elements. And the basic idea is that happiness can be defined broadly and deeply, much like the Greek philosophers were defining it. You know, thinking about happiness not as a state, a temporary state that you can go in when you get something new, like a Tesla, which would make me very happy. Um, but, you know, broadly and deeply defined along many categories that would lead to a more meaningful life, a deeper life, a life of more satisfaction. Um, and so Shenzhen defines it as these different um, sort of categories, types, going across the rows. And then I'm not going to explain the whole thing, but in one category you can see as you move down, you go deeper and deeper down the levels. Now, the claim is that mindfulness skills and the application of those skills is going to let you move deeper down all of these levels and also across them. So I'm sure most of you can relate to having some type of pleasant sensory experience that you haven't fully embodied. You know, you've flown across the world, you've, you've gone to Belgium to see your favorite band, you've spent all this money, you're there, you're having a pleasurable experience, and you're just not totally getting it, right? So this is the claim. These focus techniques, these mindfulness skills, will let you more deeply embody experiences like that that will lead you towards the dimension of happiness. Now, what's really nice about this is that the patient can come in and define what these are for themselves. So obviously, I'm a white male on stage telling you that I'm going to come enlighten the world with this technology, but I shouldn't be the one to define that. It should be the patient. And so operationalizing it this way gives the patient a way to tell us what looks right to them. And then we know whether we're pushing them in the right direction or not. Um, 30 seconds, I think. Um, in the last slide, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some of the ethical dilemmas and things that can come up. There's a lot going on here. We're talking about modulating the brain, changing neuroplasticity. We're talking about putting energy into the system that's relevant for the core self-process, uh, that's a very dangerous thing to do, obviously. And so many people come up to us and say, well, this is just a shortcut to meditation. Isn't effort, isn't, isn't the sort of con the cultivation of these skills an important part of this? And our answer is yes, of course. We're not talking about replacing mindfulness, uh, mindfulness practice. We're talking about actually giving people the ability to learn these acquisitional skills quicker so they can then apply them into their lives and feel the actual changes in their lives that come from living mindfully. Thank you.